I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, the historic visit of Pope Francis to Auschwitz-Birkenau, where one and a half million were murdered, almost all of whom were Jews. This was the 79-year-old Argentine pontiff's first visit to the Nazi extermination camps. He's the third pope to visit Auschwitz, though he's the first pope who did not live through World War II. One rabbi who accompanied the pope on the visit is Rabbi David Rosen, the AJC's International Director of Interreligious Affairs and the man whose lifetime of service in his field has earned him, among other awards of recognition, Papal Knighthood, which he received in 2005 for David's contribution to Jewish Catholic reconciliation. And then in 2010, David was made a commander of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II for his work in promoting interfaith understanding and cooperation. David is on our JBS phones from Jerusalem now. And David, it's so wonderful to have you back on JBS. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be back with you. First of all, David, what was it like to visit Auschwitz-Birkenau with the Pope? Well, it was a very special uh, event precisely because of the unique character that Pope Francis gave to it. And it was very powerfully, um, it was the impact of silence that was his decision to visit Auschwitz without speeches and without any formal words as had been in the past. Yes. And, it, you know, and that was a, um, had a very, as I say, powerful impact, especially because it wasn't the Pope who had kept silent about the issues. He'd spoken and addressed them in the past, and therefore it was clear that this was, in the face of this evil, he felt that the only appropriate response was to stand in, in silent tribute to the victims. Yes. I consider that to be really a very moving statement on his part. And in that regard, were there throughout the trip especially moving moments that moved you, David? Well, I wasn't with uh, a present at, at the other um, um, at the other event in the course of the Pope's uh, itinerary in Poland. I was only present when he was in Birkenau. Yes. Um, but, you know, uh, because it was on a Friday, so I was stuck for Shabbat in Krakow, and uh, there were more than a half a million young people in the streets of Krakow who had come from abroad, in addition to those from Poland. And they had a very special, almost festival atmosphere, these youngsters in groups singing and flying their flags, and all very much animated by the occasion that Pope Francis uniquely contributes to with his own personality and his own style. David, what motivated the Pope? You spoke about it for a moment. But what, what do you think really motivated him to make this visit at this point in time? Well, it, it's actually quite a simple answer, Mark, because he was in Poland, in Krakow, for World Youth Day. Every three years, the Catholic Church organizes this massive gathering of young Catholics, and not only Catholics, though it's primarily young Catholics from around the world, and therefore, it was on his schedule. It, in other words, Krakow was on his schedule before Auschwitz. But once he was going to be in Krakow, it was very clear from the outset that he intended to go to the camp to, as I say, pay homage to the memory of the victims. Yes. There. And in a sense, it's, if you like, the third historic station on the papal itinerary of Jewish Catholic reconciliation. Uh, he had visited Israel, uh, visited the synagogue in Rome, and the significance of those visits only really becomes fully apparent in the shadow of the tragedy of Auschwitz. In other words, the transformation in terms of Catholic-Jewish relations and the respect for Israel's renewed sovereignty in its ancestral homeland. Mm -hmm. I may be asking a question which has no more complicated answer than the one you gave, but this is not the first time the Pope visited Krakow, correct? 
I don't, in all honesty, I don't know, but he hadn't visited Auschwitz before. Yeah, I was just wondering whether he'd been there, been to Krakow before, had chosen not to go to Auschwitz, Birkenau, and that for... Knowing, knowing this Pope and knowing how much he um, understands the significance of the Shoah, uh, it's difficult for me to believe that he would have purposefully avoided going to the camps, but you know, I don't know what it, if he did go visit that Krakow, I, I don't know where that Tindy was, and it takes good hours travel to get from there to Auschwitz, and I imagine he would have been to other places that might have been more accessible. Okay. Now, again, were you literally with him at Birkenau? Yeah. So, we were literally, in a sense, I wasn't the only one. There were other people there, but we were gathered there at Birkenau. He came up to the place where the memorial um, proceed is not in front of the memorial are the different stones in the different languages and tribute to the victims of the Shoah. He stood next to the memorial with a rather large memorial candle which he placed and stood there in silent meditation while others were around looking on. And then the only words that you heard there were the chief rabbi of Poland, Rabbi Michael Schudrich, reciting as um, um, verses of uh, reciting Psalm 135 and then reciting the Kaddish. So, in other words, in addition to the Pope's silence, which, as it were, spoke so powerfully, the only words that were heard publicly that resounded out in that terrible sight for all to be able to hear were in Hebrew or an Aramaic and the Jewish memorial prayer. Yes. I'm, I understand. Can you put that picture back up, Sloan? I understand that in addition to uh, my, my, the rab, chief rabbi of Poland doing it in Hebrew, there was a Catholic priest who also did it in Polish. Is that correct? He, he recited the psalm, yes. He recited the, the, the psalm in Polish. Yes. In other words, translated it. By the way, David, that had to be a very moving moment for anybody there, yes? Absolutely, absolutely. It was very, very moving and very powerful, and it was... But the combination of both the Pope's silence and the recitation of the psalm and the Kaddish highlighted the unique Jewish significance of the site. So obviously, there are universal implications of that site, but we, obviously it's important to sustain the Jewish particularity, and the Pope did that in his own special way. Did you observe anything moving him particularly uh, as opposed well i think there were two things that moved him particularly and perfectly uh, as they would move all of us uh, these were the meetings with the survivors and the meetings with the righteous gentiles who had saved people during the period of the show ah. uh, in particular the form of the meeting with the survivors was uh, striking in its warmth I'm, i mean both his predecessors had met the survivors of the Shoah, and each uh, were also extremely moving in their own way. But Francis is a very warm individual, and also it's probably part of Latin American culture. And it wasn't just a handshake and expression of solidarity. It was a warm embrace with each one that I think spoke very powerfully and moved many to tears. That is lovely. And again, he also met, I understand, with 25 righteous Gentiles who risked their lives to save Jews, yes? Yes, and they were present where we were. We were all together then. That, that was in Birkenau. He met with the survivors in Auschwitz I, and then in Birkenau then met where, where he where paid silent tribute. That was also where he met with those righteous Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Naturally, all of them are advanced in years, and therefore for some it was a big effort just to be there, but it was a enormous, powerful significance for them all. David, what do you think it means to the Jewish community that the Pope went to Auschwitz-Birkenau? Well, as I said, Mark, I think it is one of the three major sites that affirm the Church's transformation in its attitude towards the Jewish people and its recognition not only of the tragedy of, within Jewish history, but implicitly of the fact which the Vatican document we remember that was issued in 1998 says that 
anti-Semitism had found its place within Catholic teaching and practice and contributed um, to not only people failing to resist evil, but even to collaborating with it. But he didn't need to say that there because in his first um, epistle when he became Pope, uh, Evangel- Evangelii Gaudium, uh, there he says specifically that this new friendship with the Jewish people is all the more significant precisely because of past tragedies and the persecution of the Jews often and especially when perpetrated by Christians. So I think for the Jewish people this um, visit and the whole and this papacy is uh, an embodiment of the transformation that's taken place in Catholic Jewish mm-hmm. relations. Mm-hmm. But today the Catholic Church is not only not part of the problem of anti Semitism, it's in central part of the solution. This, of course, doesn't mean that there aren't still anti-Semites around, but this is something which you've got to hide today within the Catholic Church, and that's an incredible achievement that we've come this far. Yes. By the way, take one more moment and reflect on that, because there's been a transformation even during your personal career. Can you talk about how, what the difference is, let's say, from the... You know, the first time you became, you, first time you visited the Vatican, or the first time you became involved in interfaith work, and where we were as a Jewish community then, and where we are now as you accompany the Pope of Rome to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Well, the revolution, of course, as you know, began 50 years ago uh, um, and with the Second Vatican Council and with John the Twenty Third, the Saint John the Twenty Third, who. I would say for many Jews, is considered to be a saintly personality. Of course. But that was still only, as it were, the beginning of the beginning. Yes. The one who took it to a new level was John Paul II. But even with John Paul II, who I was privileged to meet about a dozen times during his papacy, it was still often tentative. For example, in his, even when he went to Auschwitz, I'm sure it wasn't a conscious avoidance on his part, but he never referred specifically to Israel. And um, even the references were kind of language of the people, the children of Abraham, language which for him was precise, but nevertheless there was a sense within the Jewish world that it was rather difficult to get it out and to be fully effusive, to fully uh, express the um, the character, the language that would be the intimate expression of Jewish identity and especially of the reborn sovereign state of Israel. And indeed, it, it was a while, it took a while before John Paul II actually galvanized the Vatican apparatus to engage with Israel and therefore establish diplomatic relations. As you know, I was privileged to be part of the small team yes. that negotiated those relations. Absolute, absolutely. Now, now today we're at a, a situation of where Israel-Vatican relations are flourishing. It's taken as a given that there is mutual respect between the Jewish state and the Catholic Church. Um, the words, historic words of John Paul II, which were trailblazers that the Jewish people of the dearly beloved elder brother of the Church, that the relationship with Judaism is something that's intrinsic to the Church, is now taken as understood within the Catholic world, or at least within large sections of it, and within Catholic school books and educational materials are up such positive attitudes towards Jews, Judaism, and even Israel, I think probably some Jewish Sunday schools could do with having some of those materials. So the transformation is really quite stunning, and there's nothing quite like it in human history. Mm-hmm. To have seen a particular people as formerly, to have seen them as condemned, as rejected by God, even in league with the devil, to, be, to demonize and even dehumanize them, and now to be in a situation of where you see them as the closest uh, religion to you, the fundamental roots that you have to respect and that you have to cherish, there's nothing comparable in, in human history. And um, I think that has a universal message, because it's such a bad relationship could become such a good one in such a relatively short time, just 50 years, then there is no relationship, no ha- matter how poisoned and how chronic it is, that can't be transformed. That is a beautiful expression, 
And you're very wise, David. Thank you for that. Incidentally, does it matter at all that the Vatican has refused to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel? That's not true, Mark. Uh, in the fundamental agreement that was signed the, the, between the Vatican and Israel at the end of 93, leading to full diplomatic relations in 94, there is a, a, a recognition that Israel has, uh, it has established its own particular capital in Jerusalem, but there is in that clause, that sort of the clause of, to be precise, was an addendum to the fundamental agreement, a statement on the part of the Vatican that this recognition does not mean that it takes any position with regard to the final borders and the final um, um, geography regarding to where the, um, the, the borders of the state of Israel reach. In other words, the Vatican as a state and with interests in the Arab world and with communities in the Arab world is hedging its bets politically. But that doesn't have any problem with the fundamental idea of Jewish sovereignty in Jerusalem. And it has said so and stated so many times. Does the Vatican have a diplomatic mission? Is the major diplomatic mission of the Vatican in Jerusalem? The Vatican has a full ambassadorial representation here. That's called a nuncio. That's the term for the ambassador of the Vatican. And while formally the office of the Vatican, of the nuncio, is in Tel Aviv, the residence and therefore the office and the day-to-day -day operations of the Vatican is in the nuncio's residence in Jerusalem. Very, very nice. Okay. David, I want to say something that must be said very sensitively, because I want the audience to understand clearly uh, what I am asking you and what I am not suggesting, and it has to do with it has to do with the uh, Pope's comments about overall suffering in the world today. I recognize that there is terrible human suffering in this world, much of it inflicted in cruel and what we would call inhuman ways on children, women, men of this world. We should all be aware of it. We should be outraged by it. We should even be consumed with addressing it and ending the suffering today, if possible. At the same time, there was something hideously unimaginable in the calculated cruelty of the Nazi enterprise to rid the planet of the vermin Jew in as callous and unnecessarily degrading and painful way, almost making sport of it, doing it even at the last moment when there was no point to it. What people don't seem to comprehend is that the Nazis did not simply kill Jews. They relished killing Jews. They enjoyed killing Jews. The human brutality is breathtakingly unimaginable, and it was real. So, David, when Pope Francis says after visit, visiting Auschwitz that cruelty did not end at Auschwitz and Birkenau, it is still around today. In many places in the world where there is war, the same things are happening. David, the same things are not happening today, even where there is war in the world. And I'm asking you, first of all, for your reaction to the Pope's words, and whether you think the Pope understands, came away from Auschwitz understanding there was unparalleled evil symbolized by and epitomized by Auschwitz. How do you respond to all this? I would even go further than your comments, and I would, in order to emphasize the uniqueness of Auschwitz, not the uniqueness of Nazi bestiality, in particular towards the Jewish people. Uh, I would use the phrase of, of my esteemed colleague, Rabbi Itz Greenberg, who says that in order to understand the uniqueness of the show, we must bear in mind that even a Jewish embryo was intolerable for the Nazis. So there is unquestionably a unique evil that is confronted at that particular location. I wasn't present 
uh, with the interview that Francis gave. So I don't know exactly how it was asked or how, um, he, what specifically he was responding to or how he was responding. But I, I would point out that with any kind of comment, when you have other sources to be able to put the comment in context and to be able to cross-reference it to, it's really important to do so in order that you can make a fair assessment. And in the book that Pope Francis wrote when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, as Cardinal Bregoglio, together with the Rabbi Avram Skorka, his Jewish friend, the book on heaven and earth, he acknowledges the uniqueness of the Shoah. So he has specifically stated his recognition of its own particularity. I imagine, and I don't think that he would for one minute deny that. I think he simply wanted to emphasize not in the totality of the so-called final solution, but in terms of the fact that people can be dehumanized and people and the perpetrators can desensitize them to themselves to the point of where they ignore the divine image in human beings and behave in such a bestial manner, that that kind of conduct can still exist because uh, it is unfortunately... um, part of the dark side of humanity itself. So I certainly don't think he meant in any way to disparage or to minimize the uniqueness of the Shoah. I like the way you say it. And again, no one, not I, nor you, nor no one should try to trivialize the pain which human beings continue to inflict upon themselves. David, I believe this is something that has been with us from time immemorial. And the question is only how in the world could a civilized, what was then a civilized Western Christian nation engage in the kind of uh, savagery? It wasn't, people have to understand, David, it just, it wasn't simply that six million Jews were killed or uh, and non-Jews and gypsies and, and Catholics and they didn't limit themselves to Jews, but all Jews were victims during the Holocaust. It wasn't simply they wanted to kill people. They wanted to kill people in ways that had never been conceived of in a systematic attempt that is represented by Auschwitz and by Birkenau, and they did it with relish and with cruel, with just cruelty that goes beyond even the pain that is caused during wars that you and I have seen and have mourned and have asked the world to stop, and we still see it in parts of this world today, and it is, a, it is, it is criminal in every humane sense of the word, but it is not Auschwitz-Birkenau. And that's all I wanted to say, and I believe your answer both echoes my comments and then in some way, as you always do, you said it in an eloquent way. Is there anything you want to add? No, I agree entirely with you, Mark. Um, um, There's nothing that can can be compared to the Shoah. And at the same time, one must affirm that there can be no relativization of pain. Exactly right. Individual's pain is as absolute as another's pain. Absolutely. Now, lastly, I read something, David, and I don't know if they're referring to you or another rabbi. I was... I read that a rabbi asked the Pope basically to remove the convent that's built built near Auschwitz. Is that correct? I think you're referring to the article that Rabbi Avi Weiss wrote calling on on Pope Francis to remove the church from the commandant's house. Now, let's just put this in its geographic context. The, the commandant's house of Birkenau is not within the precincts of the camp. It's on the other side of the road that you travel on when you go to the Birkenau camp. And uh, the question, therefore, is not so much about religious symbols within the camp, but religious symbols close by the camp. And I understand that in terms of the wounds of Jewish history, there are those for whom the presence of a cross, even within sight, of these places of such tragedy is a scandal. But I think it's time after what we've spoken about now in the last 50 years for us no longer to see the symbols of Christianity 
as the manifestations of hostility or of the enemy. But to recognize that these are their symbols in sincerity in terms of their own religious affirmations and, and way of life. And to be able for them to have, have a place of prayer and worship close by, at places where there are plenty of other victims other than Jews, even if we were the overwhelming vast majority that were also there, but to be able to express it in a manner which they don't intend in any way, God forbid, any kind of insult or, or uh, injury to the Jewish people. I think it's something that we should be able to find at least as bearable, if not to be able to respond to with equanimity. So David, sum it up for us. What's been the significance of Pope Francis's visiting Auschwitz-Birkenau? I asked you about the Jewish world. I'm now asking you, you know, in the overall world scene, what's this all mean? It is the powerful expression of the repudiation of evil, of the commitment to speaking up in its face of the evil, but to be silent in the face of its tragedy. And I think that Pope Francis also uh, embodies this um, new era in the life of the Catholic Church that seeks to be a source of blessing in the world, as all religions should be. And I think in many ways he is. Beautiful. You know, David, I know you work for the American Jewish Committee, but I want you to know in terms of the fabulous work you've done in Catholic Jewish relations, in interfaith work in general, in the interreligious affairs that really need to be smooth and cooperation encouraged and dialogue encouraged, in that work, there's no one like you. And in essence, We'll get, while you work for the AJC and they should get credit for you, you are carrying the banner for all of us, for the entire Jewish people. And I always love having the, the opportunity to speak with you. The next time you're in New York, you've got to come back and sit in studio with me. And I will continue to chase you for in the news whenever there's something that you should be speaking about. But I thank you for all you do and for all the kindness you've shown me. Thank you very much, Mark. Be well. Blessings from Jerusalem. Thank you, my friend. The thoughts of Rabbi David Rosen, International Director of Interreligious Affairs for the American Jewish Committee. He's also a papal knight, and he accompanied Pope Francis on his visit to Auschwitz. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, program coordinator, Serge Goldberg, editor, Dennis Golan, to JBS Associate Director Dara Golub, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Mm -hmm.